Hello, everyone. Welcome to myself, Max McGillivray, Editor-in-Chief at Beanstalk Global. Today, we are live with the amazing Healthy and Sustainable Food Group. Mark, Amy, Barbara, all say hello, please. Hi, everyone. Hi. Um, guys, can you remember how many of these uh, we, we've done now? Uh, we've been running it on a monthly basis, but it feels like 10, 11, 12. What do you think, Barbara? I was going to say nine. I, I don't actually remember when we started, but it's just been a great platform for discussion and, and sharing what people are doing out there in the world of healthy and sustainable food. I've been I've been so impressed by the, the speakers who we've had and also the, the things that come out of it where you get people connecting to each other so that they can learn more about specific things. It's been really good. Yeah, but and the, uh, the viewership that we're, we're getting is tremendous. We're, we're, we're getting in the region of over 7,000 views for these uh, for these broadcasts when we're streaming live on Facebook and, and LinkedIn. So it's, uh, it's really, really take, taking effect. And, and Barbara, we must just uh, we must just show off on your behalf. Where are you today? Because we're so proud of you. Where, where are you and what are you what are you doing there? I'm in sunny Belfast and I had no idea how much light and how much brightness there is in Belfast. So I arrived here about three weeks ago to start a PhD in nutrition. So for the next four years, I'm going to be studying what's called the Healthy Aging Diet Study and looking at how we can improve the lot of people over 65. So what tools can we put in the toolkit to get people living healthier lives? So without the kind of cognitive and physical um, issues that, that we're seeing at the moment. So how can we prevent that by having a healthier diet? Um, Amy, she's a she's a real powerhouse, our, our Barbara, isn't, isn't she? She's she's. I, I wish I had the the mental <laughs> intelligence to be anywhere near near uh, like like Barbara, but Amy, you have. <laughs> Say that again, sorry. Aren't we impressed with our Barbara? Oh yeah, of course. <laughs> and and then, Amy, Amy, whereabouts are you? Because we didn't ask in the in the green room. Because you, it's, it's delightful to hear of your location. Oh no, I'll be disappointing you this time, Max. I'm actually in St Helens. I'm in the UK. Uh, oh, um, Amy's yeah. uh, no, normally in the sun, sunny Greece. So uh, welcome to uh, welcome to our weather. Yeah, well, actually, it's raining in Greece right now, and it's sunny here. So I think I've made the right decision. Oh well, well done. Okay, so let, let's uh, get on with this. We have got some amazing expert speakers over, over above our group founders, and we are majoring on the subject today of eco labeling, what it means for consumers and, uh, and businesses. Um, let's just give a bit of a background to uh, the group of healthy and sustainable food, especially for those on the listening on the podcast. Our uh, key industry professionals have come together to form this unique group to constantly examine what would be the results if people from different sectors were to collaborate on solutions to produce healthy, sustainable food ongoing. And the founders are Barbara Bray, MBE of Alio Solutions, Mark Driscoll, Tasting the Future, Jackie Green, Veridas Associates, and Amy Colford, Public Health Nutritionist. And the aim of the group is to improve nutritional quality of food and availability for all social economic groups in the UK. They're going to do this by bringing individuals from different sectors together for projects on sustainable nutrition. And our platform, Beanstalk Global, is proud to host this series of ongoing monthly uh, broadcasts for them. So eco-labeling, what it means for consumers and, uh, and business. A new eco-score has been piloted by major brands in the UK and Europe. Currently, consumers don't have the inf information they need to make more sustainable buying choices. Clear labeling on carbon and environmental credentials will help them support the brands and products doing the right thing by our planet. And today we're going to discuss the pros and cons of eco-labeling and what it means for consumers and businesses. And we've got three key individuals that we're going to just bring, bring on in, in, a, in, a, in on at the moment. But here I've got uh, a cabbage that got dropped off to us uh, earlier, and it's going to be fascinating to see how we eco-label something like this all the way to a, to, to a fizzy drink. Mark, do you think it's going to be possible? Do you think eco-labeling is going to work for all of us? Uh, thanks, Max, um, and lovely to have everyone on today. Um, yeah, I absolutely uh, do. Uh, I think Britons uh, are used to checking traffic light scores to compare the kind of calorie, fat, sugar and salt content of different foods. Uh, so it's about time we had a new environmental label to make sure people think about um, the planet's um, health too. Uh, and, and certainly there's been a launch, a plethora of new eco labels launched recently. Foundation Earth um, launched a new environment score or a viro score. Looks really measures kind of carbon, water usage, water pollution and biodiversity. It's rated on a sliding scale from A plus to, to, to G, A plus being great, to G um, not so good. Uh, and food groups like Tesco, Sainsbury's 
reminisce of some of those big names working with, with Foundation Earth. To do that, I think really to inform a citizen consumer behavior, but more importantly, um, to help uh, suppliers and those brands improve their own um, sustainability performance. So I see it as a positive thing. Well done, Mark. Just had a WhatsApp. Someone is, is just a, was an MD of a, of a large food company. Uh, another label. Here we go. Trying to drive social, economic, um, behavioural change. Will it work? Question mark. Question mark. We can get into that in a moment. Let, let's have a let's have a, um, a meet up with our with our experts that we gained today because we've got some um, fascinating individuals in. Uh, in Julianne, Tom, Jonathan, could you hop in, please? If you could turn your videos on. So, Julianne, let's start with you. Who are you and who are you representing, please, Julianne? Great, so hi, thanks so much for having me. Um, I'm Julian Calouette Noble. I am the managing director of the Sustainable Restaurant Association, which is an organization working with the hospitality sector in primarily the UK, but more increasingly becoming global in our, in our reach, um, working on sustainability issues across the hospitality sector. Thanks, and I bet you're busy. We are very busy right now um though i would say that it's still one of the most challenging moments that hospitality has ever found themselves in um the last 18 months have been extremely difficult and then i think coming out of it though there's an increasing awareness of sustainability and desire to um to deal with sustainability there's also a massive staffing crisis happening in our industry so those two things can be our kind of competing aims right now well done. well done. And your group has got a great reputation for the great work that you do within within the sector. So, so well done. Jonathan, who are you and who are you representing, please? Hi, good afternoon, everybody. I'm Jonathan Sutton. I'm the um, group safety and environmental exec for Westphalia Fruit International. So Westphalia Fruit, that, uh, for those that don't know, as we're in 14 or 15 countries around the world, we are a vertically integrated producer, mainly avocados, but we do also produce a lot of other fruits, citrus, blueberries, grapes, um, cherries, mangoes, et cetera. Um, and yeah, sustainability for us is, is absolutely critical. We, you know, we're founded um, really from the 1930s, 1940s and our purpose to do good. So it, it yeah. sits right at the heart of everything we do. Uh, and I've got a, a, a very big personal connection with uh, with Jonathan and his business because they virtually saved my life when I when I did a motorbike trip through Africa to promote fresh produce and uh, we came into in, into South Africa and they helped us out uh, enormously which I could bore people with uh, uh, another day. Tom, over to you. Who are you and who is a great organisation that you represent, please? Hi everyone. My name is Tom Cumberlich. I'm a director at the Carbon Trust and the Business Services Team. So for those who don't know the Carbon Trust, uh, we're an organization set up back in 2001. Uh, we work with um, businesses, with governments, with institutions around the world um, to help them align with our mission, which is to accelerate the move to a sustainable low carbon economy. Um, we work with uh, those businesses and governments to help them understand their impacts, um, how they can uh, transition, what sort of strategies they should be putting in place, what targets they should be putting in place to, to align to net zero goals. And uh, we also provide assurance uh, and we also do a lot of work on low carbon technologies as well. So helping to understand what are the sort of key energy systems of the future that we need and how to accelerate the development of those as well. So. Tom, thank you. We, we did a recent broadcast about the issues that uh, we're all seeing, all encountering in respect of uh, lack of haulage, lack of um, lack of labour and um, supply costs. And I had two clients uh, ring me up on the back of that saying that, um, yes, uh, suppliers, growers need more margin from the retailers, but if they all uh, aimed to be carbon neutral or better, um, the, the market would be self-fulfilling. Uh, would be um, would, would point itself in the right direction. Uh, Max, you've got to get the carbon trust on because we all need to adopt the carbon trust principles. So it's uh, it's, it's great great to, to have, have you on, and it's it's great that there's this uh, movement towards uh, you your, yourself and your your colleagues to try and make that uh, make that change. So to let's let's just do a, a bit of a, a deep deep dive with them um, with each of you for four or five minutes, and then we'll get going to a, a fast paced Q&A. If you're uh, watching and you've got some questions of any of our experts or any of the group founders, please uh, put them in either via Zoom or via WhatsApp or on the, on the platforms you're watching. Um, and we'll, we'll see how we, uh, we get on from there. Tom, Jonathan, if you could just turn off your, your video. Um, so Julianne, how, how did you get into um, hospitality? What, what's your background? We have, we have so many uh, graduates that dial in and, and they're, they're so inquisitive and they seem to learn from um, individuals like yourself and experts like yourself, Jonathan and, and Tom, to get a bit of guidance to, as to where they should go within this mercurial world of food. How did you get involved with the food tech? 
uh, I've got a kind of long and winding road to, to the food sector in some ways because my actual uh, education was in education. And so I thought I was gonna go into schools and, and um, education and I'm obviously American. Um, and one of the biggest things that really struck me was how can we possibly expect children to learn when children are hungry? And that sort of led me to, um, to thinking more and more around the issues, the politics around school food. And um, this was around the time that Jamie Oliver had done a food revolution in the US, kind of building off of his work that he had done with school dinners in the UK. And um, I got really ignited by that. I did a postgraduate degree in nutrition and came over to the UK and started working for Jamie on school food campaign. Wow. And so the start of my, um, of my time in living in England was uh, five years working, running Jamie Oliver's kind of school food programs and working in food. And then that led to um, working at the Sustainable Restaurant Association and actually realizing that restaurants have such a, um, are in such a unique position to do um, so much good for a lot of the challenges that we're, we're facing, not just because restaurants and the hospitality industry as a whole is quite a impactful sector. We are, um, you know, we use a lot of resources. We emit a lot of, um, of uh, carbon and, uh, and other things. Um, we're an extractive sector by nature because we take, you know, and serve food. Yeah. Um, and we're also a sector that has a lot of, you know, is at the core of a lot of social issues around um, pay and uh, employment and all sorts of things. So um, it was sort of a, an interesting transition to go from, from school food into, into restaurants and realizing that restaurants, when they get it right, um, not only are doing immense good for their own kind of business, but they also um, are kind of cultural markers in the same way that Jamie is kind of a cultural icon for his campaigning. Restaurants can really be um, something that changes behavior outside of the restaurant. Well, well, well done. And through this, oh, the, these, let's just call it the, these dreadful two years that we've, we've been through um, oh. and all everything that your sector has, has gone through. I'm, I'm, I'm an optimist. Do, do you think there's going to be a, a, a very big positive for your sector when we eventually get back to uh, normality? Yeah, I'm an op I'm definitely an optimist as well and um, have been having conversations lately, um, you know, with a lot of trade media in particular that are kind of um, have been poking me a bit on why do I sound so hopeful and I actually do think that um, a, a, a lot of hospitality comes out of, cre you know, creative moments come out of um, the biggest challenges that we're facing yeah. and um, that's when I think you see the biggest kind of shifts, revolutions, um, changes in in hospitality, and I think we need to, we needed to shift as a um, as an industry to be fit for purpose for the next kind of stage. We need to start taking um, you know the environment seriously. We need to start recognizing that climate change is a is an existential risk to the the sector, and so to act like not just that um, you know not just that this is good. To make you feel good to do the right thing environmentally but also it's good business we need to transform the way that things are done um, within the sector in order for it to survive and i think that the the consumer the the diner is more malleable right now than ever before yeah, well said. So our um our habits have been so disrupted over the last two years and nobody really knows where the diner's going to actually land because we don't know we're we're, we're we're still experimenting. Is it going to be entirely work from home? Is it going to be more of a hybrid? Are people yeah. going to go back to cities? Are people going to, you know, what is all this going to look like? And when I'm talking to a lot of restaurants and a lot of large brands in particular, the large brands that are long time set in their ways, there's no way we could ever take these things off our menu. Our customer would hate us or they wouldn't come back. Now, all of a sudden it's like they had to change in order wow. to it's amazing. The delivery need. And so sure, you know, they can, they can rethink and maybe they don't need as much beef on their menu and maybe they, yeah. you know, can look at things a bit differently than yeah. before. So. And, and I will get into it in the Q&A, but so with the, the eco-labeling of the subject of, of today, it, do you see that as a positive or, or, or a negative for your sector? I'm overwhelmingly a positive, I think. And, and, and there's, there are a few reasons where 
A, I think that we need to stop, uh, you know, relying on kind of greenwashing and marketing terms. Yeah. And we need to start being more transparent with our customers. There's more and more evidence that, that consumers want it. And there's more and more evidence that consumers expect businesses to be doing the right thing. And so the wool is really pulled over their eyes when there are those, when there are claims that are not backed up. So I think transparent systems, um, you know, things like the eco score that was, that were being talked about, um, the work that we do, we have a rating for restaurants, um, so that there are, you know, clarity in, in definition of terms and that you yep. are all kind of using the same playing field. Now, the, the flip side of that is I do think, um, it's yet to be seen, you know, we've got to get it right in terms of how customers understand things. There's there's such mixed bag of evidence in terms of nutrition, you know, calorie labeling. And I know it's something that we, we've just had another kind of legal push towards more calorie labeling, but actually there's not a lot of strong evidence that calorie labeling encourages people to do the right thing, or to, to eat fewer calories when they dine out. Now, I think eco scores are different from that because Calorie labeling, the truth is, majority of people don't actually understand calories. Those numbers yep. mean well nothing. Said. And I think when it comes to eco scores, we need to be really conscious that we're not just like flipping a carbon number onto a menu because there's no context for that. I don't know. Is that good? Is that bad? What does yeah, that mean? Okay. Um, and I think we need to be guiding the consumer. I think, you know, I like the A plus to Gs. I like the, the, the traffic lights, that sort of stuff that helps people make better decisions. Well done. Jonathan, can you can you come in? Julianne, um, just on one point, collaborations, if, if you look at, uh, there's been a, a recent uh, press release, um, if, if you call it a collaboration, um, that Jonathan's business has, uh, has just been accredited uh, with some of the key carbon trust um, um, elements that they've worked really hard to, to work at. With your group, do you think there's collaborations to be had with the likes of Jonathan's business? Jonathan's business is one of the largest growers, as he, as he mentioned in the, in, the, in, the, in the introduction of, uh, of avocados and other fruit. Do you think there would be collaborations to be had with the supply chain on the basis that six out of ten kids in the UK don't know where fruit and veg comes from um, to be able to collaborate with some of these amazing uh, fresh produce and fresh food suppliers like like Jonathan and his colleagues do, do you think there would be there would be a good link there to be had there absolutely I think there's all sorts of um collaborations to be had I think that you know I think that's our the way forward to getting out of some of these um challenges I think realizing that you can't just put everything in its own bin, even when it comes to issue facing nutrition or staffing or whatever supply chain, all of these things, they're actually interwoven. And the more that you, um, you know, realize that and work with partnership to, to solve that, the better. The one thing I would say is that, um, particularly with restaurants right now, I think supply chain collaboration is going to be essential because as mm -hmm. people start looking at decarbonizing their business and looking at setting a net zero strategy, there are all of those pesky, um, you know, scope three emissions that fall out, uh, that, that a restaurant needs to, to start looking at solutions for. And that means collaborating with their supply chain and their growers and looking at how do they work together to decarbonize throughout, um, wow. you know, from farm to, to plate. Julian, fantastic. Can you can you turn off the, your your video and we'll bring you back in for the for the Q and A, Jonathan? That'd be that'd be a really interesting collaboration, uh, wouldn't it? Um, with with the with the likes of the Sustainable uh, Restaurant Association and other 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 such groups, do you think? Absolutely, absolutely, Max. I think um, you know the the opportunity to collaborate is is huge. You know, we're doing all of this work at, at farm level and and you know all the way through to. Um, so our packing houses, so the scope one, the scope two, definitely. Scope three is huge. You know, I think people don't realise just quite how um, challenging the scope three um, carbon removal is um, because we can't change, fund fundamentally, we can't change where we grow the avocados and we really can't change where we sell them without, uh, without collaboration. So I think working with people who, who actually value what we're doing and, and can also pass that on to the consumer is vital. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Well, 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 well done. Collabor collaboration and, uh, and partnerships that's something I've re really learned over the last 18 months with all the various uh, podcasts. Um, Jonathan, just going back to the point that we made with, uh, with Julianne about um, people's backgrounds and uh, the number of graduates that, that list listen in. I asked my esteemed colleague, Ian Reid, how do I describe Jonathan's 
Sutton. And uh, Ian, uh, just embarrassed, uh, described you as, well, he's a rock star. He's, a, he's an industry fr fresh producer, rock star. And, that, and we're not being um, over complimentary or, or facetious, of course, but you look at your background and how um, it could be of interest to graduates as to what you've done and, and where you've got to today. Can you just give us a quick praise as to some of the companies that you've worked for, please, so that everyone can get an understanding of you? Sure. So I've, I've literally have covered uh, field to fork. So, um, you know, I started as an agronomist for Bird's Eye Unilever um, and then moved into Tesco, uh, both in the UK internationally and uh, latterly in, in, in Asia. Um, I worked for Marks and Spencer. Um, I worked for Greenyard and, and here I am now with, uh, with Westphalia. So, you know, certainly worked for um, some of the biggest companies in the world um, from a consumer perspective and certainly some of the, the people who care the most or care among the most of, around uh, their sustainability journey as well. Yeah, well, well said, because you as an individual, you could have gone off into any other sector uh, whilst you were pro progressing your career. What what persuaded you to stay in the in the mad mercurial world of fresh produce? It's so real, you know, the, as you say, you, you know, you're lifting that cabbage and it's, it's, it's just fantastic. You know, you can connect with, um, you know, the grower, the producer um, and the community that uh, that surrounds that as well and bring that product all the way through to the consumer wherever they are in the world. And I think that that connection point for me is really vital because, you know, what we're doing is we're, we're selling food, you know, we're, we're selling stories. And, yeah. you know, and I think that that's really passionate for me is to, um, you know, doing the right thing is important, but actually bringing the consumer along that journey. You know, when, you, when I was an agronomist in, in bird's eye, just growing peas in, in the Yorkshire Wolds, I had no idea who the consumer was. And then when you step into retail, you are exposed to both both sides of the story. You know, you've got the consumer who is very demanding and then you've got the um, you're trying to push the um, the demands back to the supplier and the grower, but also make it valuable for them as well. So, yeah, for me, you know, this industry has has that pivot between uh, between farm and, and consumer wherever they are in the world and you're connected. Well, well done. And I and I got to be slight, slightly over emotional about this and state that um, I think the sector of fresh food, fresh produce, um, whether it be Julianne and her members um, on, on the restaurant basis or yourself and, and your colleagues um, internationally, you make a difference um, rather than uh, energy drinks, which don't make a difference. They just deteriorate, um, especially, especially uh, kids' health. Um, and, the, and the amount of stories, Jonathan, that you and I know on a, on a fresh produce perspective, just from South Africa alone, um, and some of the um, amazing stories of getting on top of um, the likes of uh, AIDS and, and cancer awareness and, and, and some of your uh, growing outlets. It, I, I wish there was more of a way to get that story out to the consumer so that when the consumer's buying your avocado, they know the story behind it and see it on a different perspective and so look to buy more because they know that you and your company are, are doing uh, better than uh, perhaps a, perhaps an energy drink company. But that's that's probably, probably a conversation for another time, do you think? Yeah, completely. You know, I think, you know, I respect the whole of the food, the food industry, whether it's uh, manufacturing or whether it's fresh. I think, you know, we all have a part to play in, in, in diet and health and, and well-being, but you know, I think there is an element of how do we bring the story and how do we bring the the value of um, the food that we produce or the um, yeah the nutritional value back into the back into the consumer and get them to just realise that you know calorific value is important, but so is the journey that it takes. And you know, we're dealing with huge issues around the world. You know, immense drought. You know, going through South Africa as you mentioned, we're seeing droughts in you know in Chile and parts of the producing world. And then we've also got excessive rainfall in, in other countries like Colombia. So we're dealing with, you know, we're dealing with climate change on a on a day to day basis um, and actually battling through some really big, big issues. And and yet the consumer focuses on the on the now. You know, we're looking yeah. at the next um, 20, 30, 40 years and the consumer oh. is very much in the now. That's challenging for everybody to uh, to get to grips with. Yeah. And, and um, uh, Jonathan, you came to, to mention about the about the Carbon Trust and your, your recent uh, alliance with them. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, our business... John, John, Jonathan, can I just, just get Tom in? Tom, can you, can you come in? And, and Jonathan, far, far away, please. Sure. So we've been working with the Carbon Trust with our UK business, Green Cell, for, I think, four or five years to establish the, the company carbon footprint, the kind of scope one, scope two um, of our business here. And we, you know, we've, we've been on a journey to reduce our emissions um, working with the Carbon Trust to both measure but also give us information as how we can do that. And then we, we collaborated um, with our products in South Africa to get a, a life cycle analysis of um, you know, the product carbon footprint. So we, we looked at the product that we grow in South Africa and sell in South Africa and the product we grow in South Africa and sell in the UK markets just to understand the difference between um, all of those areas. And we also looked at, uh, we, we do 
processing products. So we looked at guacamole and, and oil as well. And it's really interesting how, you know, a product can produce, um, you know, something from kind of 0.5 kilograms of uh, CO2 equivalent to three or four kilograms of CO2 equivalent per kilo of product. Wow. And it, it's just massive, you know, but I think working with the Carbon Trust um, gives us uh it gives us credibility because they are renowned. You know, we're, we're, we're known as being uh, one of the best. They're, they're known to be one of the best. But also they, they bring a little bit of um, sense to it as well. So they're not just ticking boxes. They're actually bringing yeah, um, good activity into us. Yeah. And so, so Tom, would you regard, well, I'm really going to say this, John, Tom, would you regard Jonathan as a bit of the poster boy um, uh, and he, he and his company in, the, in respect of what they've done, what they've achieved with the Carbon Trust? Yeah, I, I think I think um, uh, whatever you call it, a poster boy. But I think <laughs> you know, the, the call out here is is you know um, all all businesses, you know, no matter what sector they're in, really need to be focusing in on on the carbon footprints um, with that goal on getting towards net zero. It's clear that there's a you know significant uh, challenge um, to decarbonize all sectors of the economy. So. I think you know the, the first and easiest step um, for many organisations is to take is to measure their carbon footprint. And there was a there was a reference earlier to sort of these different scopes. So maybe I can just briefly just uh, explain that. So you know the, the easier thing is just measuring the organisational impact, utilities um, emissions. So typically scope one and two. These are the easy things to do. But the real challenging thing is getting into what's referred to as scope three, and that that's essentially all the upstream emissions associated with the supply chain, the raw materials, the movement of the logistics of your products, the packaging, et cetera, um, all the way through to, to end of life. So how does that uh, break down? And uh, what about the impact of food waste? What about the impact of the packaging and end of life of the, the products as well? So so the, the importance is, is that, you know, this scope three, this, this broader impact beyond the four walls of an operations of a business typically represents 60 to 90% of the impact. So you know, the, the, the real impact is, is in these supply chains, it's in the uh, raw materials, it's in the, the packaging, it's in the logistics, um, and particularly with the fresh produce sector, then, uh, you know, it's, it's really important that we, we make the focus uh, across the full value chain and not just on the operational piece, which is okay. what most failures have done. And, and, and so on, on that basis, you'd be really keen to, to get other similar food businesses uh, like West, Westphalia um, uh, involved, partnered, collaborating with, with yourself to, for everyone to get to that ultimate uh, end game. Yeah, it has to be. I mean, the, the, the key thing here as well, is, you know, the topic we're discussing today is around obviously eco labels and putting, putting a label on products to help inform decisions, which is fantastic. You know, any anyone, any organization that's sort of in that space to try and improve uh, consumer awareness is, is, is great because is we need all the contextual analysis we can we can uh, throw at this um but the, the key thing here is not to forget that you know measurement and labeling is one aspect but the key thing is then what do you do with that data yeah, well done. how do you use it inside your business so that you can inform procurement decisions you can inform product design you can inform decisions around packaging logistics providers etc cetera, etc cetera. so the key thing here is actually the data itself and then what do you do with it so you move beyond simply the measurement aspect and then you actually look at it to inform decision making across the whole of the business yeah tom well done um, whilst we were talking i've had three whatsapps from three students what's tom's background we've had, had great great background uh, journeys from julianne and, uh, and and jonathan what's tom's background to the carbon trust a background before the Carbon Trust was, was a bit of a uh, meander to get here. Uh, so I've been at Carbon Trust for 15 years, but uh, uh, short short background was I uh, studied international politics at the university, then uh, worked in Japan teaching English for a couple of years in a fishing village wow. in uh, Japan, wow. then, then came back to uh, UK and worked in consumer credit in finance uh, and decided I didn't want to work in consumer credit for the rest of my life and then into the Carbon Trust to sort of manage carbon as opposed to debt. Wow. <laughs> so and, we are, yeah. and, and you're journey within the carbon trust uh, are, are you are you positive that you and your colleagues can make the well we don't have much choice do we are, are you positive that you can make the difference that 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 we need or is it, it's a bit like the debate that's going on with the uh, cop 26 and um uh, the, the, the chinese premier not not attending and there seems to be lots of roadblocks and the, the queen getting involved in the last last 24 hours uh, be, being the optimist as i as i stated it, uh, earlier do you think you and all of us can like can collectively make the change that we need to yeah i think you've got to you've got to stick onto the optimist uh trait here i mean we all have ups and downs in terms of our days in terms of working in the sector right but um i think when we look at the last couple of years in terms of the huge um swell of of uh 
uh, change in opinions on climate change, um, and you know, driven a lot by the media in terms of the covering the the, the severe impacts that to Jonathan was mentioning earlier in terms of drought and and rainfall and extreme weather. Um, you, you've got to look at the positives, and, and I think there are very many positives um, out there in terms of you know the number of businesses addressing uh, carbon now, the number of businesses setting up to uh, uh, set a science-based target. So this is a target aligned with this Paris Agreement, the 1.5 degree goal. So there's a there's a plethora of businesses getting behind this. And, and the question is, you know, well, why? Why now? And I think the, you know, the reasons for that is, is you know, a lot of consumer interest. We, we ran a survey just a couple of years ago. Two thirds of consumers, many of the major markets that we looked at, are, are really keen on, on product labeling. Uh, they want to see this. They want to be, say, better information available to them. And then from a business perspective, you know, what does that mean? Well, essentially, you know, those businesses are wanting to build trust with consumers yeah. need to have transparency. They need to have uh, clear, confident uh, data to develop their narratives on carbon, to develop a, a credible uh, climate change strategy, which is delivering reductions uh, first and foremost. Um, and, and they're doing that partly from a reputational perspective, but also partly from an investor perspective. The, this shift in terms of green finance, um, the shift in terms of uh, transitions that we're seeing in different sectors uh, is, yeah. is really exciting. So I think, you know, I, I'm an optimist in that sense. So you've, you've got to uh, look at this in, in a positive lens and, and there's lots of positive aspects in terms of uh, that transition to a low carbon economy. Which so, Tom, well, well said, thank you. I, I used this example to, on a number of occasions previously that Legal in General is one of the uh, UK's largest pension funds and they've stated that by the end of 2022, the 100 top companies that they currently invest with, if they don't see a diversified board with those yeah. companies, they're going to pull the funding. And you can see what's going to be the next step for the likes of legal in general. It will be this whole element of the of the, of the carbon aspect that they'll be putting the pressure on uh, the, um, the, the, the companies that they invest in. So we're going to see that, that change happening. But I mentioned earlier about um, this uh, broadcast that we did um, previously about the issues that within the sector and, and myself having two clients phoning me up and saying the issue is carbon. Five years ago, I would have never have assumed that those sorts of uh, individuals would ever have made such a statement uh, such as that. So there's definitely a momentum happening. And the more people that get be behind it and the Carbon Trust, uh, Tom, I think we're, we're going to be in a, in a good place. So, Tom, let's get everyone uh, back in. Um, and and uh, Barbara, um, if it's like, I'm just going to um, start, start with yourself. With, with the eco-labeling, Barbara, do you think, do, do you think it's, is it, is it going to overly confuse the, the consumer have we got enough of them um, of, of these uh, accreditation labeling systems all out there is is this is this just a step too far barbara i think the honest answer is we don't actually know yet so when you look at what's out there in the marketplace at the moment for example if you take foundation earth it's currently a trial and it's not just a trial on the metrics, you know, whether it's biodiversity, water scarcity, carbon, what have you. It's also a trial on how people are going to respond to that. So I think the next few months into next year, into 2022, are going to be quite telling. And I'm really looking forward to seeing the data, assuming they're going to share it in the public domain, about how people have reacted to it and about how retailers have been able to get product and, and see whether there has been a difference between those that have been labelled up and, and those that haven't. And Mark, you seem quite confident in our, in our, in our green room and our preamble that this will make a, a, a seismic change. Um, are, are you in agreement with Barbara? Uh, yeah, and, and, and these are um, a trial. So it will be great to see the kind of consumer insights um, and the lessons learned from those businesses um, involved. I think the most important aspect here, as other speakers have rightly said, this is about um, trust and transparency uh, in our food systems with regards to how and where we grow uh, our foods. Uh, and I think sustainability from a labelling perspective is missing part of that story. We're talking about environmental labelling here. Obviously, that includes carbon, but, but we should consider the kind of biodiversity, water and other social aspects um, of sustainability. So um, kind of welfare standards, living wage, a whole bunch of other issues that need to be considered. But I think it's the first step and an important first step. And we can't act without measuring um, the impact of our actions. Uh, and this is the first step in changing not just citizen behaviours, but the behaviours and getting businesses to think about how to address those scope three emissions. 
I love it when Mark says citizens behave, behave behaviors. I can't, I, I can't even say. I, I just I love, love that. Love your your, your expression. I prefer of... citizens to consumers. I, I I talk about citizens rather than consumers because citizens should be active um, engagers yeah. within the food systems, not just recipients of food. Yeah. Uh, so I tend to use the term citizens. Yeah, well, well done. And uh, just uh, all, all to our audience out there, if you've got questions for our experts, we've got some coming in. Uh, please uh, send them through so we can ask them over, over to them. Um, Jonathan, with your with your um, uh, prestigious retail connections, do you think there's retailers um, there thinking, oh, no, not, not another label system. All we want to do is sell fresh food, fresh produce um, at the best uh, the best price, best quality for our consumers. Why do we need another label? What, what do you think it, the, the view would be internally within the retail sector, Jonathan? Would this be a thumbs up, thumbs down? What do you think? Well, I think generally it'd be a thumbs up. I think the challenge of the retail sector is the competitive nature of it, um, is, you know, how do they all kind of get competitive advantage, which is, you know, absolutely not right and proper. You know, you've got Plan A um, with Marks and Spencer been running for a lot of years. And a big drive for that, but everybody else is getting on the uh, uh, the bandwagon, but getting on the journey really as uh, to decarbonize uh, the businesses. So I think the competitive nature will be their challenge. Actually, is you know nutrition's very easy, you know, but even so, they had you know challenges in the traffic lights. You know, which which ones do they use? Um, but I think what we've got to do here is not confuse the consumer. You know, as, as was said earlier, I think the opportunity is to to look at a standardization um, system. But it's challenging, you know, massively challenging. And, and Jonathan, we had to, we, we run a, a monthly broadcast for women in food and farming with Kristen, Christine Takeon, CBE chair, current chair of the of Red Tract and uh, previous uh, uh, grocery code adjudicator for the for the UK. And we talked to her about um, live, so I'm, I'm sure she'd be happy for me to, to discuss it now um, about the um, uh, recent takeover of, um, of of Morrison's. And her uh, concern was that it's just going to be uh, debt. Uh, laden a bit like uh, the, the ASDA takeover um, and those investors are just got, want, will just want to see margin return margin return so anything that's not adding value um, potentially is not going to be uh, promoted or pushed do, do you think Jonathan that's going to be a, an issue within the retail sector as you say that the, the, it's very competitive and anything that doesn't make money is, is going to get um, overlooked or it's just going to be ki kicked into the long grass this is slightly more neutral, really, because I, I think the suppliers will take the take the initiatives because we've got to decarbonize our own industries anyway. Um, so it's it's actually we're going to do it, um, whether the retailer wants it or doesn't want it. You know, we're, we're on that journey and we're going to do it. And um, because it's the right thing to do, you know, we've got to play our part to, to net zero or, or um, carbon neutral or whatever, um, whatever we the countries choose to be. If we don't do that, then the countries haven't got a hope. So. Actually, the, the, the retailers will, will almost get this for free. Um, whether they choose to use it or not is, is entirely up to them. But I think the other part of this is how are they going to tell the consumer? Because you know, packaging is becoming a little bit of a challenge. Um, space on packaging um, yeah. or space on menus in, in, the, in the hospitality sector is people aren't really reading um, packaging. And, and we're going to get rid of a lot of packaging anyway because it's unnecessary. So I think the consumer will have to go somewhere else to find this information. So whether it's on... Um, our websites or generic websites like Red Tractor, et cetera. I think that's where you know, the consumer is going to go somewhere else and, and therefore it becomes non-competitive in this space because it, whether you buy it in Aldi or Lidl or Asda or, or wherever, the data is the same. So I've got to come back to my cabbage. So, so do, do you think um, uh, we potentially will just have a nice big um, uh, 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 user-friendly label, an eco label on this type of product, um, extolling the virtues of, of, its, of its life story? What is more it, likely to be shelf edge um, or okay. or website. I think there'll be nothing on the on the package. I think the consumer will have to, or the the citizen um, will have to take ownership of, uh, of finding that information. Um, and those that choose to will do, and those that choose not to won't. Yeah, Julianne. I jump in just for a second because I think you brought up some really, really good points there, which is one that there are a lot of competing issues with this sort of thing. So the fact that we're also driving on a packaging reduction journey and that that's a really important piece of and then so you can't um, pause that journey on reducing packaging because of the like consumer information journey. So you've got you've got to manage both of these complex things at the same time, which means thinking differently about how are you going to actually use a label in a context in which we're moving away from over packaging and over adding. We don't want to add a sticker to your fresh produce we, that that's unnecessary packaging. So um, I think we need to hold complex ideas in our heads and 
uh, to come up with some of these solutions. And then I think the other thing that was interesting that you pointed out around your, your question around supermarkets and margin and, and making back profit and things, um, the same can be said of the hospitality sector right now and the fact that it's been so decimated on, on um, profits over the last 18 months and is really coming to this new post-COVID world and at a great kind of deficit economically. And yet, I almost think that businesses are starting to think about it differently rather than saying, no, we don't have enough money. You know, sustainability is not adding to our bottom line right now, so we need to put it on pause. And I think actually COVID was an example where you have this, uh, this idea of a global pandemic that was somewhere very, very, very low on your risk register as a business when you're yeah. thinking about the things that are going to happen that are going to that are going to put your profits. And I would say that for a lot of businesses, climate change has been kind of down there as well in terms of being very, very low on your risk register. And I think for a lot of the hospitality businesses that we work with, the fact that the global pandemic happened and the, the squeeze on supply chains and all of this sort of stuff, all of a sudden brought a red flag to some of these things that were at the bottom of your risk, risk register. And you now no longer can say, we don't have the money, you know, doing that thing isn't going to add to our bottom line because now it's actually not doing that thing is going to be more expensive for us in the long run because we are going to have a disrupted supply chain or we are going to, you know, so I, so I do think that um, there is some, some different thinking happening right now around maybe it's not profitable in the, in the short term, but it's way too expensive to not deal with it in the long term. Well said. And a Amy, as an expert food nutritionist, how, how do we educate the consumer in the respect of eco-labeling to, to adopt it? Um, with, as, as Jonathan said, I'm not going to get my cabbage out again, um, but um, uh, for, for them to engage with, the, um, uh, uh, with, with information in store uh, or online, how do we get the consumer to understand about eco-labeling and what difference it's, it's going to make? What, what's your view from a, from a food nutrition's perspective, please? Well... I think that when you look at environmental sustainability for food, it's really complicated. And I mean, everybody here probably has done a lot of research into this and has an idea of the different factors that come into sustainability, but we can't really expect consumers to fully understand that and do all the research. So I think eco-labeling can be a way to kind of bring all of this information together into a single score. So that's the carbon footprint, the biodiversity, the pollution pre pre prevention, uh, water use, all of those things. And it can help simplify the process for consumers who want to make more sustainable choices, but they just don't have the time to actually go and do the research themselves. Yeah, thank you, Amy. Tom, what, what's the magic wand in the respect from the Carbon Trust as to how we educate the consumer? Because we've obviously got the, the likes of, um, uh, say, say, Jonathan as our, as our um, fantastic uh, business example out there who are looking to create that change. But how do, we, how do we influence the consumer? How do we get the consumer engaged? Is it but a label? Or what, what more can, can we do? What, what's the view of the Carbon Trust, please? Yeah, I think it's, it's a combination of all these things, right? It's going to be a combination of more businesses doing more labeling. Um, uh, and, and as you know, you get more, more labels uh, appearing, whether it be the eco labels or the carbon label, um, uh, is going to be need to um, help increase the knowledge of uh, you know, what are these key hotspots in our food and drink? Uh, what are the key things that are uh, going to be more of a rule of thumb as opposed to every time you look at the, the product in the supermarket. So I think that 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 information will will build up. Um, I think there's a definite role here for education um, yeah. in terms of schools uh, and in terms of uh, chefs and in terms of um, restaurants and in terms of all of the players in the, in the food sector really to start to, to talk about you know contextual analysis. So what what is the big carbon hitters on my on my menu or in my shopping basket? Uh, and I think you know. After time, you know, you won't necessarily be looking at the label each time to understand that. Um, but there, there is a challenge there, I think, with the eco labels, and that there are so many different environmental factors that, uh, that that need to be taken account of. And I think that's a particular challenge for for food and drink. I mean, we we obviously have a carbon label, um, and we we focus on carbon and, and don't make many apologies for that, really, because you know that's the, one of the for our view to get to net zero. That's one of the main single important big issues to focus in on, and um, and carbon, carbon's relevant across all, all products and all services, no matter what part of the economy, right? So, but within, within food and drink, you do have this challenge of, of a whole range of different uh, metrics, you know, water pollution, you've got antibiotics, you've got um, mm. scarcity of fish stocks as well. 
um, you've got eutrophication. You, so you, you, there's a range of different things in there. So, so there's a, I think there is a, there's a role there for, for you know, um, a simple rule of thumb in trying to, to get to that. Whether, whether or not we're, all the scientists, are, I think, are aligned on that as to whether you also look at soil health and, and other aspects on a, on a label. It's a challenge because you know some of the science is still not fully um, uh, resolved on that front. But it, yeah, the, it, yeah, absolutely. I think as as far as is you know other tools in the um, uh, in, in the bag to try and encourage consumers to move in the right direction in the form of a label in form of a sort of a combined scoring method is is yeah certainly welcome. It's, it's great. Tom, thank you. A question and on WhatsApp, um, Barbara. If it's okay, I'm going to direct this at you. National food strategy. Uh, has been presented. Uh, the white paper uh, should be going through Parliament in the next six months. Is there uh, an opportunity or has it already been included within that white paper, um, eco-labelling? Barbara, are you aware? Is there any any aspect of um, eco-labelling within the, the white paper for the National Food Strategy? Not that I have no idea on that because um, at the moment they're in the middle of writing it so we won't get to see it until it's actually done. But Obviously, the National Food Strategy did highlight a whole load of, of things that we could, should be looking at. And it's up to DEFRA really to, to take that, take what they think is going to be workable and put that into the white paper. So at the moment, we don't actually know what is going to go into the white paper. I'm not close enough to that department to, um, to be on the edge of their shoulder looking over and seeing what's being written down. But I think there will be some interesting things that they will want to do, but as of yet, we don't actually know what the final decision will be on a whole range of those, those 14 recommendations. Yeah, it'll be fascinating to see what the outcome of that is when, when it com comes through. Um, Julianne, just we've, we've sort of made it on, on retail. Great question from Sarah, Sarah Jackson. How do you envisage the eco-labelling looking on a menu by dish, menu, se se uh, selection, section? Um, has there been any consumer research done? Uh, what, what's the, I'm going to use my expression again, what's the magic wand within the hospitality sector when uh, when we're all hopefully sitting down for a, for a gorgeous meal in one of your favourite um, uh, uh, members' restaurants? Um, how how would we identify um, on an eco-labeling basis what we're going to see in the menu? Yeah, I think it's a really good question in terms of right now there are a lot of different options out there. There are some that have started carbon labelling. Um, I think that in the context of a, again, I, I really err away from using absolute terms in terms of carbon, you know, emissions on a menu, because I think they mean nothing in the context of eating your meal, like how uh, it's really hard to understand what that metric ton means. Um, I think it's really important that it is not universal because the, the key message we're trying to get across to consumers, right, is that, that your there are differences in your choices. So, there are, there are certain foods that are more impactful than others. So actually we at the SRA definitely urge against things like, um, you know, there's, there's a scheme out there that's called carbon-free dining where it's a pound on the bill to um, plant trees to kind of offset your menu. Your, but, but there's not really a consideration in that about what you chose. And, and so that's not really showing the consumer that like there was a difference between if they had had the lentils versus if they had had the steak. And um, so we definitely encourage it to be at, a dish level. I think those complexities are really, really important uh, when it comes to food. So I appreciate what was said earlier um, by Tom about the Carbon Trust having a carbon score, but I do think that when it comes to um, food in a restaurant, we need a more a more nuanced than just carbon because, and I think especially from a restaurant's perspective in making decisions, um, we're doing it now with a lot of restaurants who are trying to, to create their path to net zero. And you can get into some uh, poor decision making if you're if the only metric you're looking at is carbon and because it yeah. can lead you towards um uh moving away from the biodiversity you know of your of your menu and saying here's uh you know i had a really great conversation with a, a kind of small chain who was saying that um you know the from a carbon perspective they would be encouraged to replace their um, you know, they've got one meat, one red uh, ruminant meat item on their menu that's coming from a small farm with a producer that's, you know, doing all this, this amazing stuff for the biodiversity of their land. But from a carbon perspective, they would be encouraged to switch that to a jackfruit taco coming from, you know, Vietnam, Vietnam and their supply chain. And there's a lot more complexity to what that looks like if everybody rushes to switch every item on their menu yeah. to jackfruit in, instead of beef and, you know, or to soya products instead of. So I, I think we need to be more nuanced. We need to have more um, more factors that we're looking at. 
the SRA, we obviously look at the restaurant as a whole. So we give a score to the restaurant as, as a whole. And then that includes things like also looking at the social aspects of the restaurant and how they treat people Brilliant. and how they're engaged. So there's a lot of different options there. And then the final thing I would just add is that um, the QR code came back during the yes. pandemic. I think everybody yes. was expecting that the QR code was well dead. Um, and it's been incredible. It's been really funny to kind of see how much that has re-emerged as part of our consumer behavior in a restaurant. And the thing about that is actually it gives way more real estate to restaurants to tell their stories and um, to find those opportunities if they, you know, are engaging through a QR code to, to talk to their consumer about what's on their menu. Yeah, well done. Uh, Jonathan, that comes back to that store example, doesn't it, of, of, of having the QR code, um, as was previously trialed, but didn't, didn't get anywhere. Um, and, um, I'm sure you've already built this into your into, into your marketing to have the QR code on, on product or um, in, in store so that we can find out uh, about the journey of the, of, of the, of the avocado. And just, just go back to Julianne, what she said about uh, counting carbon. Um, Tom, um, for you, really interesting question from David, David Burrows. David, thank you. Eco labeling is potentially powerful but there's a land grab going on this week the environment agency and igd both announced separate projects and environmental metrics with a view to more information to consumers we also have ecoscore foundation earth carbon trust footsteps carbon neutral are we in danger of spending more time counting carbon than cutting it tom is that if that's okay to present that one to you yeah, sure. No, I'll try and take that one. Thanks Thank for the you. question. Um, yeah, well, from my perspective, I think it's just really exciting because, I mean, we, we launched the carbon label back in 2007. Um, and that was after the, you know, the, some um, development with the BSI and, and DEFRA on how to develop the world's first carbon footprint standard. And, and you know, since then, um, you know, we've had uh, labeling uh, introduced. Uh, we did a, a project back in 2012, which was looking at um, personal carbon allowances, which is, again, sort of providing this context. And I think Mark helped uh, some, some feedback on that report at that time. The, 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 the challenge, I think, is... Um, uh, yeah, how do you how do you how do you use the, the data to inform decision making? And that's that's kind of at the, the heart of what we we do at the Carbon Trust is is you know measuring not purely for reporting but for a driving decision making. Um, be that from a consumer pers perspective, if you're wanting to inform to consumers about the um, the impact of your products and services, or indeed what you're doing to to reduce it so we'd always encourage you know any any organization that uses our, our label specifically is to provide more context to the consumer or to the citizen or to um, the the business around what that means so um, what what does that footprint mean what are you actually doing about it in terms of reduction uh, measures and, and how can uh, you know the the citizen play their part in terms of using that information as well so um, you yeah. Tom, thank you. Um, Jonathan, uh, with, with you, with your business, have you looked to engage with EcoScore, Foundation Earth, Food Steps, Carbon Neutral, or are you are you just happy with your alliance with Carbon Trust? What's what's the view within within your business? Yeah, we've looked at all, a lot of them. Um, we've certainly spoken to um, the eco labels that are coming through, really, because we're driven by our consumers. So retailers are our our bread and butter in the UK, particularly. So if the UK retailers are gonna go down a track, we need to follow that track as well. So we've spoken to them. The, the, um, the Foundation Earth label is, is really interesting because as somebody else mentioned, it's got balance. It's not just about one thing, it's about uh, the, um, a lot, particularly on water as well, which is is a key ingredient. So um, yeah, we've, we've talked to them. Um, we, we'll watch it with, uh, you know, with, um, with interest. Yeah, and it's interesting to see what's happened with Tesco's and Leaf um, in the last, uh, whenever that was, Jonathan, the last 10, 10 days, two weeks, that, that there does seem to be this uh, this movement towards the best system out there that has been proven, an example of, of, of Leaf. And you look at the Carbon carbon Trust, you look at your alliance that, that you've uh, got with them. Mark, what's, what's your view of uh, David's question, please? Um, so, yeah, I, I think it's um, really interesting. And, and, and I think the Foundation Earth um, scheme it has potential because it combines a number of different aspects of um, environmental sustainability. I, I just kind of want to make a point, I suppose, that particularly post-COVID, many shoppers are now increasingly going online. We've talked a lot about labelling. Um, we know a lot of people are, you know, we've got a increasingly reduce packaging and therefore there's going to be less space on whatever limited packaging there is to communicate the information. I think we haven't really talked about the potential of using 
digital information and digital labeling to communicate with an increasing number of online customers. So, for example, there's a really um, useful app that's just been launched. It's being trialed it, called Sustained. It's an app that you can download. And what it does is it um, gives a environmental sustainability score when you're shopping on Sainsbury's. I think Sainsbury's, Tesco, I think Waitrose, automatically this app comes up and gives a sustainability score. And it's very linked to uh, citizen values. So different citizens have different values. Some people are more concerned about climate or animal welfare. Some are more concerned about health and nutrition. So it's aiming at tapping into citizen values and their own concerns. And I actually think this has huge potential, I think, to communicate, provide transparency um, to citizens around the environmental, uh, social, health, uh, dimensions of their food choices and actually at the same time potentially point them in the right uh, direction. So I think we need to think about labelling much more broadly through the kind of online digital platforms that are out there. Well, well said, Mark. And I remember interviewing, I can't remember his name, um, one of the main buyers at uh, Adocado, um two, two, three years ago at the London Produce Show. And to, as he said, he would love to have more supplies, especially fresh produce supplies uh, to give them uh, relevant videos that they could uh, then put up and he gave an example of uh, when they get um, organic blueberries they just they just sell out and if they could have a video from that suppliers to the journey of that they felt that that would uh, engage the consumer um, even even more so but they were having difficulty three years ago persuading the supplier um, to actually invest in doing doing that that marketing that 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 video but but Jonathan I'm, I'm guessing that that'd be something that uh, the likes of your business is, is already already looking at to try and capture that um, online element as uh, as Mark has stated yeah absolutely you know the the information to connect the consumer to the to the producer is is absolutely vital so you know however we do that online on our own on our own portals or um using you know using forums and platforms like this to be fair um you know i think the more messages they get out there the better informed consumers are going to be excellent okay everyone so we're slightly um run running out of um out of time do you, do you so we're, we're all positive that this is the right way to go um eco labeling um barbara help me that here this, so this is currently a trial what's the next state of um, of play how how are they going to assess whether it's been successful or not are, are they deploying the likes of kantar to um statistically analyze the the the, the, the details how, how can you see this proceeding please barbara i think like it's been mentioned already there's there are quite a few different initiatives out there so some are more established than others. And you know, they, they're also not just in the, the retail space. We've got Pumpus doing what they're doing with Birmingham University. There's, there's a whole range of trials out there. So I'm sure the way that they will be measured isn't going to be consistent, just as the way that they've all been put out is yeah, has slight differences. But what will I'm pretty sure will happen is that anywhere where there's a university involvement, there will be that evidence-based piece of work that comes out and assesses. This is what we trialed and this is what the outcome was and be able to see how consumers behaved and that piece that Mark touched on about consumer behaviour is key because if you look at the note that, that David Burroughs has sent us saying that 88% of European consumers think sustainability information should be compulsory, whether people actually do anything with that information when it's there remains to be seen. So I think the actual research and getting that evidence from the trials is key. Barbara, thank you. Um, Tom, we briefly covered it with um, when Jonathan mentioned it earlier that there's potentially going to be less less packaging. Do, do you think that's also another route to success to, to get, get, get where we all want to get to by reducing the packaging or and collaborating with the packaging manufacturers globally to, to source better packaging? What do you think, Tom? Yeah, I think that's a challenge. I mean, pack Packaging itself has, has quite a, a range of different um, uh, issues to consider there. I mean, it does play a, a huge role in terms of um, helping to prevent food waste as well, which has to be said, right? Yeah. So there is, a, there is a tricky balance here in terms of, um, uh, you know, f again, not trying to pick too many um, different environmental criteria, but packaging, you've obviously got the carbon, you've got the pollution aspect, toxicity aspect, and how you deal with it and can it be recycled or not, et cetera, et cetera. So, so again, you know, <laughs> using that sort of eco-label uh, criteria is the same thing you need to do with packaging. It's, it's, a, it's a trade-off 
Um, uh, you know, it, it provides many, many benefits, um, but also, you know, there's this, uh, it's, it's quite, uh, uh, it's quite a, a challenging issue when we look at you know, documentaries, looking at packaging, ending up in oceans, etc. So you know, it, it does need to be sort of considered in, in a whole range of different uh, ways. There. Yeah. Tom, thank you. Okay, everyone, I'm going to get my crystal ball out, be my cabbage, and I'd, I would like you to look into it and make a prediction as to what we're going to see three, four, five years out in the respect of eco labelling and it, if it's going to make it make a change, whether it be in the retail or, or the restaurant sector. Uh, Julian, let's start with yourself. What, where do you see this going? Where, where, where do you think this will be three years, five years out, the, the whole area of eco-labeling, please? I think we're going to start seeing, um, uh, you know, in five years out, we'll start seeing eco-labeling more compulsory in the line for large businesses in the way that you see calorie labeling um, for, lar for the largest food businesses. Um, and I agree with all of the things that were said before, which is that I don't actually think that we'll start needing to label every individual product, but we need to start teaching um, the kind of general gist. So I don't actually think we need to always know every single cabbage. We just need to understand the difference between fresh produce and processed foods and meat and dairy and all that sort of stuff. Um, so I think that'll be, I think, I think food, large food businesses will start doing this um, and it'll become more compulsory over time. I think the other key thing is that we'll start seeing slimmer menus um, as a trend and moving towards um, a little bit less of this idea that, that um, restaurants need to be serving all things all the time mm -hmm. and more towards a, um, a slimmer, slimmer set of choices um, in a positive that's, way, I think. That's, that's some fantastic points there. A Amy, what's your view looking into our, our crystal ball cabbage? Uh, well, I don't know whether this is realistic for three to five years time, but um, I can't remember who said it now about the QR codes, but I have this vision now of sort of digital supermarkets where everyone can go around and scan each item and get not only the information about sustainability, but also nutrition and health information as well, so they can make their own decision. And the same thing would work for restaurants as well. And they've already been trialing the labeling in uh, workplace canteens and things like that. So I think that kind of system could be something that could be used across the board. So, yeah, I don't know whether five years is realistic, but looking to the future, I think uh, it's definitely feasible. So, Amy, thank you. Jonathan, looking into your, your crystal ball avocado, uh, where, where, do you, where do you see this, uh, the, this subject, this, this area being about three, five years out? I think a lot, a lot more companies will start to measure uh, and therefore understand where they are today and where they need to be going forward. So definitely that will that will take place. And I think because of that, more information will just be available on whether it's on products or in uh, in stores or, or websites, QR codes, etc. But, you know, I think in probably more likely five years, we'll start to see a lot more labelling um, in store or on packaging. But I think also that journey, the consumer or the citizen will also be on a journey to to understand it a little bit more for themselves. You know, they have to take they have to play a part in this um, because th they are part of the, the supply chain. Yeah, well, well said. I go back to the example I said with the, with Tom about these individuals uh, phoning me up, clients phoning me up and uh, saying that the answer to uh, the fresh produce success is, is carbon. If we've got businesses like yours, Jonathan, um, creating these alliances with the likes of the Carbon Trust, so sometimes you, you could accuse the, the food sectors of being slightly like sheep. We, we need uh, more uh, strategic players such as yourselves to make this change for, for, for us to, for the rest of us to, to, to them, them follow. Um, Tom, looking into my crystal ball cabbage, uh, what, what would you like to see? Yeah, there are going to be really lots more labels, I think, and more companies like Westphalia to picking this up. I think there's also a um, key, key theme here in terms of, you know, the use of this data. So there's going to be more data. There's going to be more AI to be able to collect this information more efficiently. The costs will come down. Um, and how will that data be used? I think they'll be used to sort of help um, citizens, um, businesses make more informed decisions. Um, but also, I think there's going to be a key theme in terms of, well, that was your footprint three years ago. What's changed since then? How are you tracking your reductions against the measurement you've taken three years ago? And have you actually made any progress? And are you on track to this net zero goal? So I think the measurement and the labeling, yes. But a big thing I think is in the next three years will be how you're actually tracking those reductions and how you're actually right. getting better data from your suppliers to provide a more specific information on how your progress against that product and that product's footprint is reducing against goals of, of net zero. Tom, well, well said. The tech is there. The tech is there. It just needs the uh, the input to be inputted in. Uh, Barbara, where, where do you see this being? You know what, Max? I'm seeing it like 
Betamax and VHS. People are going to put their money on one or other of these things, and there'll, there'll be one system that emerges victorious from it. It's just that it's too early at the moment to say what it's going to be. Uh, what, Barbara, what well said, it's a, yeah, it's a, it's a bit like uh, personal computing was in, in the 80s, and look where it is today. It feels like this is where, to use the, 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 the video example, it feels like that this is where this, this subject is. There's so much more to, to, to go at, but it, but it needs to happen. Uh, Mark, would you like to wrap up for us, please? Looking into my own crystal cabbage, um, I think two years time, you'll see a lot of eco labeling online on the digital platform. That's where the real innovation within five years, you will see more labeling schemes. Um, I think to Tom's point a little bit, there'll be more pressure for more what I would call open source data. There is lots of kind of data collection points. Some of it's in quite private hands opening up that data, sharing it for public good, I think there'll be a lot more pressure on businesses uh, to do that uh, in the future. Citizens, thank you very much. This has been a masterclass from, uh, from all of you. Uh, just before we wrap up, we've got a slightly fr frivolous one um, because we've got this uh, amazing expert from the, the restaurant sector. Uh, Julian, could you give us three recommendations? I've just had this request from about WhatsApp. Could we have one of your favorite restaurants uh, to take our kids to? Uh, a restaurant to, for a dating couple to go to and a restaurant for <laughs> us all to go to. So off the top of your head, could you, could you nominate those three cool. member restaurants, please? Uh, so the, the first one that comes to mind on taking your kids to, um, and again, I don't know where you are in the country, where you are in the world. Just don't um, worry, hit, hit us. What comes to mind is, is Oaxaca. Um, I went yesterday for a meeting and they have some really brilliant new vegetarian men, uh, items on their menu. They've got a really great kids menu. Um, definitely go check it out and try their new Oaxaca mole where they're moving away from avocados to using British grown pulses and beans. Check it out. Um, place to go for, I know, sorry. <laughs> uh, date, dating couple, a dating couple. Dating couple. Um, okay. Bye. It's got to be um, Honey and Co in uh, in London, um, beautiful Israeli restaurant. Oh. One of their other um, other places, um, just beautiful produce, beautiful food. And what was the final one? All of us, we're all going to go go for a meal to cel celebrate uh, surviving this broadcast and enjoying it. Uh, oh gosh, there's so many places that I would say that we could go out. Um, uh, I'm going to go with um, with one of the pubs in the Culpepper group because they are working towards the net zero targets. Um, we obviously want to go for a drink. Um, they were part of our pilot for um, net zero pubs and bars. And um, Duke of Cambridge got great organic produce and links with Riverford Farm. So those are my those are my top of my head. <laughs> okay, is everyone happy with that uh, that meal selection for us all? We'll, we'll see you next Tuesday. Uh, right. Mark's picking up the tab as normal. That's fantastic. Everyone. Uh, been a masterclass from, from yours, as I said. Thank you very much for your for your time, Julianne, Jonathan, Tom, and the, our, um, our our founder members. Uh, it's such an important subject, and I think um, creating the conversation with this group rather than being part of the conversation is so important to see if we can um, help to to create the change in the uh, in the industry. Thank you all, one and all. We'll see you at the the, uh, the next uh, Healthy and Sustainable Food broadcast in November. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Excellent. Bye bye. bye, bye, bye.